Welcome back to another edition of Force Friday, where we talk about Star Wars theories, characters, concepts, comparisons, analyzations, collectibles, and more. And today we're going to continue with part three of our LucasArts series, which unfortunately doesn't actually include a whole lot of LucasArts, but continues the kind of Star Wars gaming aspect of it all through different companies, transformations, etc. And I think you'll see at the end of this why we had to split it into three parts. It was just too much stuff. So LucasArts was officially shut down on April 3rd, 2013. Several employees later held a mock funeral and reminisced about the studio's years of work. Three games were in development at that time. 1313, which we talked about last episode. First Assault, which was a first person shooter inspired by Call of Duty and Battlefield. It was going to be original trilogy only and headed up by Republic Commando's Tim Longo. It was going to be multiplayer only, relatively small, focusing in on one aspect, ground combat, to fine tune it instead of all-in-one battlefront approach. And it was heavily inspired by Generation Kill, 2008 HBO miniseries, based on the 2003 invasion of Iraq, which if you haven't seen, I strongly recommend. And the third game was Wingman, about a guy looking for a girl and he brings a couple of his bros to the bar with him and you play the bros trying to entertain her less attractive friends and the goal of the game was to get your buddy a girl for the night i think that was it anyway it was either that or a standalone space combat game i can't remember they were also planning a battlefront 3 and weapons lead tony rouse said of the cancellation part of it was because we were developing a couple of games that were a little more violent not a lot more violent not gory not embracing blood and gore and such these were star wars games for grown-ups or at least for teens not kids. Rouse points out comments Bob Iger made about looking into the link between video games and school violence. He believes licensing may have been a way for Disney to put some distance between themselves and their more violent output for a time. Which makes me think of a Marilyn Manson quote in an interview where he once said, does music cause people to do what they do? I think people cause music to do what it does. But perhaps a discussion more for nerd rage than here. So let's enter the EA era. EA, EA. EA, EA. If you're from Baltimore, you get that reference. On May 6, 2013, Disney announced an exclusive license with video games juggernaut Electronic Arts, owners of multiple smaller game studios like DICE. The contract was from 2013 to 2023 and gave EA exclusive rights to Star Wars console gaming, presumably with a clause that Disney could withdraw it if it wasn't happy. More on that later, obviously. Founded in 1982, EA made a name for themselves in the sports game arena, however, became increasingly corporate as the decades went on. They were, and still are largely regarded as one of, if not the single worst, video game publisher of all time. For their churn it out style, excessive microtransactions and loot boxes, and employee mistreatment, which allegedly includes mandatory and excessive crunch, extreme working hours up to 100 hours a week near release, squashing of unionization, etc., etc. Only one year prior, Consumerist awarded EA the worst company in America. And again in 2013, they won it twice. This move by Lucasfilm was largely criticized. But on the business end, it allowed for Lucasfilm to make profit and expand their brand with minimal financial risk. But that also kind of reeks of the lack of heart, in-game interest, and when I say game, I don't mean video game, and commitment by a corporate entity that many were concerned about regarding Disney at the time, perhaps still are. But let's talk about Battlefront 2015. EA had dice the studio responsible for the hugely popular Battlefield series, develop a reboot of the Battlefront game. Announced at EA 2013, an original trilogy-only game, commonplace at the time, when Disney, Lucasfilm, and even The Force Awakens marketing was referencing the prequels as little as possible. The original trilogy setting tied into the popular idea that Disney and The Force Awakens were going to quote-unquote fix Star Wars by moving back to the style of the original trilogy. You gotta remember that the prequels were widely hated at this time and had not seen any kind of widespread popularity see. They were regularly bashed in the media and pop culture, and yet now aren't quite viewed the same, because those kids that loved it when they were kids grew up, something we've talked about on this channel numerous times. Anyway, one thing cool that they did was they scanned props and created assets so accurately they have been used in the movies like Rogue One, easily the most accurate Star Wars game ever made to that point. It was released in November 2015, one month before The Force Awakens, when hype was at its most extreme. It was a colossal financial hit, selling 14 million copies, but with a mixed reception 
Reviews were average, but the graphics, the accuracy, technical aspects, and immersiveness were all praised. However, the criticisms lied mainly with gameplay, map variety, and content, and this is probably because the game was designed to appeal to as broad an audience as possible, even non-gamers, and to that, I bought it. But this is a case of trying to satisfy everyone and ultimately satisfying no one. So what do we do? We make a sequel. Battlefront 2 was revealed to much excitement. 2016's Battlefront had proven DICE were an exceptional developer once again. Content from the sequel trilogy and prequel trilogy were included this time, and the E3 gameplay reactions were extremely positive. It featured a huge marketing campaign and rollout, which tied extensively into the new canon and apparently the upcoming Last Jedi. As more of the game was revealed, the microtransaction system became apparent. However, much like being disappointed by the grand and wonderful Wizard of Oz, when you get to see him behind the curtain, as more of the game was revealed, the microtransaction system became apparent. This involved the spending of real-world money to unlock characters, weapons, etc. You could pay to win. The microtransaction system was built around loot boxes, a random mechanic that lets players trade in game or real currency for items, which had become popular in the decade prior, mostly thanks to EA with their FIFA series. At the time of the release, it was revealed it would take 40 hours of solid playtime to unlock a single hero character, or one could drop a few dollars, and that's how the system works. EA defended their position, aimed to give players a sense of pride and accomplishment. In the single most downvoted Reddit post in history, 667,821 downvotes, which is now in the Guinness Book of World Records. The controversy then broke mainstream, with widespread coverage by news media, what was being called gambling aimed at children. Belgium, Hawaii, and Singapore governments all launched investigations to determine the system's legality, and was ruled to be gambling in Belgium courts. This association between Star Wars and illegal gambling allegedly soured relationships between Disney and EA. EA lowered the playtime to unlock heroes by 75%, and then, only one day before launch, entirely removed the microtransaction system the game was built around. This allegedly came directly from Bob Iger, who was apparently furious over EA's handling of the brand. The game released to mixed reviews, variety, gameplay, weapons, and heroes were all praised. The campaign, loot boxes, extensive grind times heavily criticized. The game saw a steady drop in players after launch. EA had promised free post-launch content that was initially slow. Despite this, Battlefront 2 has made what is widely considered to be one of the biggest turnarounds in video game history. DICE completely rebuilt the in-game unlock mechanisms and began releasing new maps, heroes, and modes, including several returning ones from classic Battlefront. By 2019, the game was largely redeemed, the general consensus being that EA has totally screwed DICE over and now allowed DICE to fix the game, and actually just recently the game was free to play on PC and saw an influx of over 20 million new players, a staggering amount for an almost four-year-old game. So ultimately, at the end of the day, the game destroyed EA's reputation, but improved DICE's. So what came next? Jedi Fallen Order. Announced at E3 2018, developed by acclaimed Titanfall developer Respawn, the disastrous launch of Battlefront 2 meant EA largely took a hands-off approach to this game most likely to keep Disney happy. One of the only AAA games of this decade to be fully single player with no DLC or microtransactions. It launched in 2019 to critical acclaim, even with skepticism from the press and the gamer community after the disastrous results of Battlefront. It was praised for story, characters, gameplay, combat, campaign, length, and the lack of any monetization, which is insanely rare today, and has a sequel coming with the Jedi title becoming a series. And just recently released with Squadrons, a first-person flight simulator set post-Return of the Jedi developed by Motive. It's a small game with a cheaper price point, a spiritual revival of LucasArts X-Wings and TIE Fighter. X-Wing had maintained an extremely niche but dedicated community. Squadrons is designed to appeal to this fan base. Largely seen as another great success, praised extensively for its gameplay, flight controls, and degree of player control. I will tell you, I just started to play this game, and I'm having a hard time with the controls. Now, it may be because I'm just a bumbling doof, but I haven't had any problems necessarily in the past. Well, except for X-Wing and TIE Fighter, which is his harkening back to where I spent hours looking for ships to destroy but only found space. Maybe it is me. So what's going on for the future? Despite Fallen Order's success, the media and gamers largely wanted EA to lose the license. EA continues to be considered the world's worst gaming company and regularly gets into anti-consumer controversy. This past year, EA CEO Andrew Wilson said they have a tremendous relationship with Disney and would be doubling down on Star Wars games. 
games. This seems to have been proven to be not entirely accurate. All in all, we only saw four major Star Wars games between 2010 and 2020, not counting the mobile games. And then only one week ago, it was revealed that Lucasfilm's video game division had been revived as Lucasfilm Games, its 1980s slash 90s title, which makes sense because Disney cannot get themselves away from the original trilogy era in any of their representations. Anyway, let me bite my tongue. But it will be the new home of all Star Wars games. EA will remain a in quote unquote important partner, but no longer hold exclusive license, despite the contract extending until 2023. This seemingly confirms reports that Disney was unhappy with EA and the important partner is probably a PR spin. Lucasfilm Games will license individual games out to studios on a case-by-case basis. Bethesda, acclaimed creators of the Eldar Scrolls and Fallout series, are developing an Indiana Jones game, totally out of left field and widely praised. Ubisoft, creators of the Free Roam Assassin's Creed series, are developing an open-world Star Wars game in that style. The aim, according to interviews, is to get back to the golden days of LucasArts from the mid-90s throughout the 2000s. Countless games are rumored. Fallen Order and possibly Battlefront 3 coming from EA, who can no longer mess around with exclusive content. Contract. This move has been extensively praised, and few thought a corporation like Disney would ever go back to this type of system. A lesson clearly learned, hopefully by all. Hope you guys are staying safe. Hope you guys are staying sane. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Until next time, take care.